Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Whiting. I'm your dean. Um, happy birthday, Gund Hall. It's the 50th birthday of, of Gund Hall, so it's um, entirely appropriate to celebrate in front of Petra Blaze's um, Golden Curtain, because the 50th birthday is, of course, the golden anniversary. Um, so a big happy birthday. So 50 years ago in 1972, it would have been perfectly typical to see this site um, that Gun Hall was built on as a tabula rasa. It's literally cleared and ready for a new era. Today, however, we're aware that a cleared site is anything but empty. Um, our building, Gun Hall, sits on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what's now known as Boston and Cambridge. So I'd like to pause and pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past, present, and future, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. The school also recognizes the work of the Harvard University Native American program in cultivating the relationships that led to the creation of this land acknowledgement. Let me also offer a quick reminder that we have live captioning available. I always find it incredibly distracting, but it's, it's also really amazing. So it's available for, um, uh, for our audience here in, in Piper and also for our virtual audience. If you're watching us virtually, to enable the captions, you have to click on the closed captioning button at the bottom of your live stream window. And I ask everyone to be patient um, because think how hard it would be to transcribe live, and so there will be mistakes. Um, so be tolerant. Also, I invite you all to join us this Thursday at 6.30 p.m. for the Rouse Visiting Artist Lecture with artist Lucy Raven, whose lecture entitled State Change in Old Gags will present materials related to several of her recent moving image installations. She's an amazing artist. So I highly recommend coming to that talk. And finally, please, a reminder to vote. So I, I first met tonight's speaker exactly 22 years ago when I spoke at the Sahans Conference, the Society of Architectural Historians of Australia and New Zealand, for those of you who don't know the acronym Sahans. Um, I flew from Boston to Auckland on election night, only to land gazillion hours later um, discovering that we still didn't have a president. That was the Gore-Bush election. Um, so our election was still undecided. So that was one of the first US elections that taught us all how critical every vote can be. So please, please, please vote. I'll note that Gund Hall is the only polling place on the Harvard campus, so we'll have a lot of people voting in the pit tomorrow. All right, back to the birthday bash. This evening, we welcome Paul Walker, professor of architecture at the University of Melbourne, that's in Australia, though don't be fooled, he's actually from New Zealand, where he teaches architectural history theory and design. Although Paul writes on a wide variety of topics and in many formats and venues, his focus has largely been on modern and contemporary architecture in Australia and New Zealand, and about British colonial architecture as seen through a post-colonial lens. Paul is the curator of the truly beautiful show outside this room in the Drucker Design Gallery, John Andrews, Architect of Uncommon Sense, that officially opens today. That translates to we're having a reception right after this event. We also welcome back MDES 2021 alumnus Kevin Liu, who stayed on for a year after graduation as an Irving Instructional Technology Fellow. Kevin, whose master's thesis was entitled John Andrews' Laconic Legacy co-curated this show with Paul. The show also includes new photographs by Noritaka Minima, um, who also joins us this evening. And actually, Nori, if you can give me the, the book, that was one of my talks. Thanks. Thank you. I was wondering where it had gone. Of course, it got loose. Um, so the, the show also includes Nori's extraordinary photographs. Um, following Paul's talk, you can direct questions to any of these three who will join me up front. And I want to take a moment to thank our director of exhibitions, Dan Borelli, and the entire exhibitions crew, Ray, Jeff, Anita, Sarah, Jesus, Joanna, and David, for an absolutely terrific exhibit that extends beyond the Drucker throughout the building. 
And a publication parallels this exhibition effort. This is the only copy, um, which isn't even mine, um, but I'm going to hold on to it for a little while. Um, it, it's also entitled John Andrews, Architect of Uncommon Sense, and it's published by the Harvard Design Press here at the GSD, and it should be out any day now or any week now. Paul is the book's editor and its primary writer. It's a project that he's been working on for the past decade. Um, and it's a real privilege that it's found its home back here at the GSD and on this significant birthday. Thanks to Ken Stewart, Marielle Suba, and Chad Klopfer for editing and designing this volume. It's a really beautiful book. Sadly, John Andrews passed away this past March, so while he saw the work of this research in progress, he never saw its completion. Thanks to the magic of Zoom and the efforts of Kevin, I met John Andrews once last year. We had a Zoom conversation about Gund and about his ideas of how he'd like to extend the building if he were given the opportunity. In short, he was shilling for the job. Even through Zoom, his personality was unmistakable, and I'll quote from Kevin's thesis to just give you some flavor of this larger-than-life man who, even on Zoom, seemed really, really big. John Hamilton Andrews, Kevin wrote, is the quintessential, quintessential knockabout Australian, terse and straightforward. His affable personality won him the respect of his American peers and mentors but his laconic sensibility would ultimately prove a liability later in his career. His brevity in publication, as well as his reluctance to theorize or historicize his work, would frustrate later attempts to situate his career and projects within the American modernist or brutalist narratives. So you see what Paul was up against, the challenge of trying to capture this laconic figure. Before we hear how Paul met this challenge, let me just read you an email that I received very early this morning from John Andrews' family. Dear Dean Whiting, the Andrews family congratulates you, the staff, and the students of the Graduate School of Design, Harvard, and the Gund family in achieving the 50th anniversary of Gund Hall. We are grateful for the efforts of Paul Walker, Kevin Liu, and yourself in creating this rare and impressive exhibition celebrating the work of John Andrews and the people he collaborated with to bring these buildings to life. Our family is certainly disappointed we could not attend the exhibition opening in person. As late as last Friday, the travel bag was at the ready, but things didn't align. John was very proud of Gund Hall and considered it one of his finest, most exciting architectural achievements. The opening of Gun Hall was so important to him that he brought the entire family and his mother from Australia for the occasion. The event made a lasting impression on each of us. More recently, John enjoyed his talks with Kevin and was re-energized discussing with you the future expansion of Gun Hall. He too had his bag packed in at the ready. Must be a family thing. We hope the opening and the exhibition are well received and we wish all associated with Gun Hall a very happy 50th. Kind regards, the Andrews family. With that, let's turn to Paul's talk. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, it's now customary in Australia also at events like this to have an acknowledgement of country, as it's called in Australia. Um, and so let me start by acknowledging that the University of Melbourne, where I work and where most of the um, research for this project was undertaken, uh, sits on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and welcome all First Nations people who may be with us this evening or um, who may view uh, this uh, talk digitally. Um, I've got a few thank yous to start with. I, I really want to uh, give my thanks, well, really to the whole GSD family for, for this uh, opportunity uh, for taking on the book and for the exhibition. Uh, in particular to Dan Borelli and, and his team uh, for the really wonderful installation uh, and my co-curator, Kevin Liu. Uh, for the exhibition design and the design of the book, um, I'd like to thank Willis Kingery and Chad Klerpfer, and uh, really uh, to um, the Harvard Design Press for taking the John Andrews book on. 
I'd really like to thank uh, Ken Stewart and um, Marielle Suba. Uh, I, I think it was the press's idea to bring Nori Taka Manami on board, and, and uh, I'd really like to thank uh, Nori for his huge, huge contribution both to the exhibition and the book. I mean, I have to say this, this book has been the le you know, very painless to deal with from, from the, the point of view of publication. Um, uh, it's been a, a great pleasure. Um, there are several people who contributed to the book uh, who have worked with me on the Andrews Project, uh, and I want to uh, mention them all to, uh, uh, right now. Um, Mary Lou Lobsinger of the University of Toronto, Paolo Scrivano, who is now at Milan Polytechnic, um, Philip Goad, who's my colleague at the University of Melbourne, Peter Scriver, um, a Canadian native, but um, now teaching at the University of Adelaide, and Anthony Moulis of uh, the University of Queensland. Um, they've each written a, a chapter in the book, um, John Andrews, Architect of Uncommon Sense, um, and really I, I don't think I could have um, dealt with the career of this man by myself because it was so, uh, it was so dispersed in its locations, uh, and that's why I wanted a team um, to work on it. Um, lastly, the exhibition on the book both had the support of the Andrews, or have the support of the Andrews family, uh, and I thank them all. Um, as uh, Sarah told you, John Andrews died in March this year, uh, and until his last days, was himself always very supportive and available to me. Um, he read the book in draft, um, uh, and uh, I, I, you know, we, we had the book and draft in December, and I took it to him, and he read it in December and January, rang me up several times to tell me all the things that I'd got wrong, um, uh, and uh, and he agreed to disagree with me on some things. He allowed me to um, to have my own views of what he'd achieved and and what. Um, and, and how, how we should frame his achievements now. He absolutely loved seeing the early ideas for the book's design. Um, and I'm sure he would be very, have been very happy with the look of the book, um, uh, though sometimes not with its contents, I think. Um, The book, John Andrews, Architect of Uncommon Sense, is organised around key projects and building types that Andrews designed, and, and then it's arranged more or less chronologically. But across those building projects and types, several themes are examined. Geography, the third generation, urbanism, building, environment and sustainability, teamwork, and the cultural agency of the architect. And six of these themes are highlighted in the exhibition. I want tonight to talk about Andrew's career by focusing on just one of these themes, sustainability and environment. And I want to trace how for Andrew's this concern developed from an intuitive, from an intuitive response on the architect's part uh, and, and how this intuitive response was overtly a matter of the building's primary form. Andrews then started to respond to expert advice and to develop a repertoire of secondary elements to address environmental factors in a more nuanced way. But these remained elements that address environmental exigencies passively. The expertise on which he called then promoted the use of active and highly technological systems. These technical means are, however, I think, beyond the abilities of architectural criticism to understand or access. And that's what I want to talk about, really, how, uh, how uh, Andrews developed a kind of uh, increasing uh, um, sophistication in his, environment, in his uh, sense of how buildings worked environmentally. And um, in, in particular, in, in, looking at Intelsat, I want to suggest that um, uh, the critics who wrote about that building didn't really know how to respond or didn't have the capacity, they didn't have the knowledge really to respond to the, to the building. I'm just going to have some water. Mm -hmm. 
Andrew's completed his um, Bachelor of Architecture degree at the University of Sydney in 1956 with the design of an airport terminal. The design features a complexly triangulated roof structure, clearly expressed, with the functions of the terminal installed beneath in a manner independent of the roof. I mean, I like a lot of airline terminals nowadays, I think. Uh, briefly meeting Pietro Belushki in Sydney as he did the airport project, Andrews asked for advice on studying in the US. Uh, Belushki was in Australia to speak at a convention of the Royal Australian Institute of Architects. Uh, and Belushki appears, reappears in this talk when we get to, um, to uh, Intelsat. The upshot was that Andrews was accepted into the Master of Architecture program at Harvard's Graduate School of Design in 1957 and graduating in 1958. Harvard was eye-opening for Andrews in many ways. Um, you know, he, he, he really saw privilege for the first time uh, in, 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 the, in the lives of some of his American classmates, for example. Um, uh, but it was the teaching at Harvard that really impressed him. Um, the design studios where Joseph uh, Louis Sert himself was a strong presence. Uh, and the seminars conducted by Siegfried Gideon and Edward Seckler, particularly their subject, uh, a subject, a, a paper called The Human Scale, which introduced um, um, the contemporary projects of the 1950s to build new, new urban um, ensembles. You know, they looked at Brasilia, the rebuilding of Rotterdam and things like that. So the human scale and urbanism um, simultaneously, I think, very important. Cert particularly emphasised that architecture was an urban discipline. As, I mean, I, th I guess everyone in this room knows, a lesson that remained with Andrews throughout his career. He always looked back on his time at Harvard with gratitude and I think with some wonder that it had such a positive, transformative experience here. While at Harvard, Andrews and three of his MR colleagues, Macy Dubois, Bill Morgan and Bill Ireland, entered the 1958 competition for the Toronto City Hall design. Andrews was the only one of the team who was registered as an architect. Uh, he was registered, registered in, 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 in Australia. Uh, their design was for a building of four storeys ranged uh, around a large internal courtyard covered with a gigantic roof supported uh, independently on tree-like structures. Um, it was somewhat like the roof of his 1956 airport terminal, I think. Andrews would often recycle architectural ideas from one project to another. But most importantly, uh, this was a response to John's um, uh, view that Toronto, Toronto's climate was cold. He'd never been there at that, that point, and, but um, um, you know, he, 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 this, was a, this was based on a climatic response. Um, so the, 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 the space under that roof was of course to be used for public events in winter, uh, and it was called the Winter Place, and a summer place um, which you can see to the, um, uh, to the top of the building in this image, a summer place, uh, an open um, square uh, was to the south. Um, this building may also, or this building proposal, may also have learned something from CERT, from a CERT project. The presidential palace that CERT designed for Havana in 1955 which, responding to a hot climate rather than a cold one, was also serried around a courtyard whose roof was supported by columns based on palm trees. The Toronto design by, and by the Andrews team ultimately placed second in the competition. Uh, the winning design was the by the Finnish architect Vigio, Vigio Ravel. On the, but on the basis of his City Hall project, um, Andrews was recruited by a Toronto practice, John B. Parkin Associates, as a senior designer. The Parkin firm 
would then partner with Ravel in uh, delivering his winning design, completed in 1965. Uh, and Andrews would play a part in resolving that building's construction issues. Uh, and here's a photograph by Andrews of the Ravel building um, as it's being finished in 1965. Living in Toronto, Andrews became further influenced to think of buildings in terms of climate response. Being from temperate Sydney, with a climate so like that of Southern California, but sort of damper, um, he, hated winter, uh, he hated Toronto's winter cold. Uh, in, two project that, in, two project that, in two projects that Andrews completed while at, Park and, while at the Park and Office, um, Here's one of them, federal equipment. Uh, this is a model, but this building was actually constructed. Uh, 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 you know, that, this building and an, another one called the Primrose Club. In both of these projects, Andrews um, erected the steel frame uh, early in the, in, the, in the project and then quickly, enclo and quick, 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 quickly enclosed the steel structure by temporary means to protect interior construction from um, extreme weather. Um, while Andrews was at Parkham, uh, that firm was involved in the designing and designing buildings for the for Toronto's international airport. Uh, and uh, Andrews designed this for, as part of that larger project. This is the control tower, um, now demolished, um, uh, that Andrews built. Uh, this won uh, the Massey Medal for 1964, um, the Massey Medals being then Canada's primary um, um, or premium architectural award. Um, uh, this is important in Andrew's career because this is his first attempt at a triangular tower. He had a fixation on triangular towers that I've never come to terms with. I don't know why, but anyway, he built these triangular towers. Uh, but another project which he did for, for the airport, uh, not built, is, uh, is another project where he is um, using form to address environmental exigencies. In this case, uh, the noise from low-flying aircraft. So the courtyard and stepped section of uh, this building, uh, the Moulton Hotel, was intended to, um, as I say, mitigate uh, um, uh, the noise from low-flying fly aircraft. Um, like the Toronto City Hall design, the Moulton Hotel is an essentially intuitive response to the environmental issue that it seeks to mitigate. And the step section that he used in this plan, in this, in this design, would reappear in many projects later, just like the Triangle Towers reappear. Uh, by 1961, Andrews was uh, tired of the park and office. Um, uh, and you, you can see why in this image. This is um, uh, men in ties. He, he found the whole idea of um, an architectural office being so corporatised, uh, distasteful. Um, he wasn't even, they weren't even allowed to wear ties that were made of, you know, knitted ties were, were forbidden. Um, Andrews uh, drove a dishevelled car and um, uh, the, the design partner at John B. Parkin, a man called John C. Parkin, there were two John Parkins in the firm, God knows how they dealt with that. Um, um, but uh, John C. Parkin insisted that John park his dishevelled car behind the building um, and, and Don Mills uh, in, um, in, uh, in Toronto's northern suburbs. Um, uh, but actually, this group of men is uh, discussing uh, Andrew's project. The building we see in, in, in the model is um, the um, Salt San Marie High School, another Andrew's project was, which has recently been demolished. Uh, and in the um, dome, you see on the right, at the upper right, uh, uh, that, that, that dome, uh, in that dome, there's another Andrew's project, um, the, the um, Primrose Club. Um, so, curiously, Andrews himself is excluded from this image, presumably because he was wearing a woolen tie or something. Um, 
so he, he tired of this office. Uh, he uh, and um, and Parkin, John C. Parkin, who was by this time enthralled to Meese, um, really Andrews felt that he didn't really exercise a Meesian rigour in his work. He, he, he pursued a Meesian look, but not the, 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 the thing itself, whatever that was. Um, so uh, what Andrews did is he spent a year uh, travelling in Europe, uh, the Middle East and India, uh, notably visiting several post-war projects by Le Corbusier, uh, and he returned to Toronto in 1962. He established his own firm doing small domestic projects and started teaching in the architecture program at the University of Toronto, at first in a master's program concerned with design in Canada's Arctic regions. I think that master's program didn't succeed to in, in attracting students. Um, we, all those of us who are academics know the scenario very well of programs that start out with great ideas and don't gel. Um, so he started teaching uh, final year design in the standard five year bachelor's program. Um, soon after a, a starting at the University of Toronto, Andrews was asked to join colleagues Michael Huff, a landscape architect, and Michael Hugo Brunt, an urban planner, to do preliminary work on the design for a new campus that the University of Toronto planned at Scarborough, about 20 miles to the northeast of the central city. It seems extraordinary to me for young faculty to be asked to do such work. It certainly wouldn't happen at my university now. Um, the, the idea seems to have been that of Tom Howarth, the Chair of Architecture, and my understanding is that the expectation that Howarth had was that the, the team would come up with some preliminary ideas to, de, to be developed into a brief for other t architects to actually um, uh, design to. However, the university, and particularly uh, the President, Claude Bissell, was so impressed by what the team came up with that Andrews was commissioned as the architect of Scarborough College. Um, this project here, again, you can see on the right the, um, the, 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 step, the step section reappearing. Um, again, Andrews' response is intuitive. Um, um, in this design, which he did with the long-established firm of Page and Steel. Um, and, you know, Andrew's idea or Andrew's description of his own intuitive response to things was, to often, was often to say they're based on common sense. It's common sense. It's, um, Scarborough College was intended to be an undergraduate college for 5,000 students of humanities and sciences. Andrews united the disciplines in a single building so that students did not have to deal with the inclement weather moving between classes taught by different departments, which traditionally uh, would have had their own buildings. But Huff, Michael Huff, the landscape architect, brought expertise to bear on Andrews' intuition. He brought knowledge of the developing ecological approach of Ian McCarg, um, under whom Huff had been educated at the University of Pennsylvania and possibly introduced this to Andrews. Um, Andrews had a sort of uh, interest in McCarg that's very hard to pin down. I don't think that Andrews would have read McCarg, um, um, but um, uh, certainly was influenced by him. Uh, one of his sons, a landscape architect, he sent to Penn to be trained by McCarg. Um, Huff also brought particular expertise to the Scarborough project. Um, he um, invited, I'm sorry, invited by Huff, a climatologist from the University of Toronto, helped the team place the building on the edge of a ravine uh, which crosses the site. Um, uh, and it also happens to be a very visually dramatic location which gives the building its, also its, its sort of bent linear form. Um, Andrews recalled that originally they had planned to build the building in the ravine, but um, the climatologist told them not to do that, I think possibly because uh, there would be more sun exposure on the more elevated location. Scarborough had to be completed very quickly with the first classes to be taught in the fall of 1965, not even two years after the building started construction. Andrews and team used the critical path method with detailed design barely ahead of construction. 
uh, and Andrews took lessons that he'd learned from his projects at the John B. Parkin office to temporarily enclose part of the project in the winter of 1964-65 to allow building of the interior to proceed. Scarborough was partially opened in 1965 and fully in 1966. It immediately attracted the attention of the architectural journals internationally and became a, a, a highly celebrated scheme. But this was essentially for its formal mega structural aesthetic, not so much for any of the technical innovations apparent in its construction. Scarborough's success led to many other university projects in Canada, the United States, and then in Andrews' native Australia. And of course, the most important of these is Gund Hall. This was a really important project for Andrews um, um, because it, he, he felt such a, a kind of um, um, debt, I, I guess, to Sert's teaching. Uh, and um, so he was very happy to have been asked to do this. It, it was a puzzle to him why he was asked. Um, uh, and these university projects, um, both on greenfield sites and on existing and, and an existing built context, such as guns, gave Andrews the opportunity to take forward both at large scale and at small scale the lessons about architecture as an urban discipline that Andrews had taken from Sert's teachings. I, I think this is primarily because it, you know campus buildings, whether they're small or large, sit in a larger kind of context. Uh, um, um, but I want to here to skip these American university projects, including Gund Hall. I mean, I know we're here celebrating Gund Hall, but I think there's so much going on um, about it. Uh, uh, I think you'll forgive me if I don't talk about it uh, extensively tonight. And I want to, to, to now turn to the project that brought, uh, that brought um, Andrews back to Australia, a project called Cameron Offices. The Cameron Offices project was offered to Andrews in 1968, um, when he was still based in Toronto, by John Overall, a man called John Overall, who was the commissioner of an organisation called the National Capital Development Commission, the NCDC, an organisation established in the 1950s to expand the Australian capital of Canberra uh, which in 1958 had a population of about 40,000, so a small town, uh, to an anticipated population of half a million by the end of the 20th century. The Commission also had the task of creating buildings um, with, the, with, the, with the required dignity of a national capital and, you know, and for government agencies who feel that they deserve you know, dignified buildings. Um, the Cameron offices were one of six major complexes for the, for, the, for the federal government of Australia that the NCDC planned in the late 60s. Four of these office complexes were to be in new suburban extensions of the city, and the Cameron offices were one of these four to be built in a new urban centre to the northwest of the city called Balconnen. When Andrews uh, began work on the Cameron offices, there was nothing at Belconnen. It was hard scrabble farmland used for sheep grazing, hot in summer and cold in winter, with very little vegetation apart from thin pasture. The Cameron Commission came from this organisation, the NCDC, um, which had considerable vision you know, they were trying to build a capital for, you know, for 50 years hence that would be suitably dignified. Um, under Overall, who was a senior architect, uh, to uh, the NCDC had developed a view of the city's, um, uh, a view that the city's new extension should, from the beginning, be much more intensely urban than the diffuse suburban manner in which Canberra had developed after the departure of Walter Burley Griffin in the 1920s. In the original brief for Cameron, the NCDC articulated this urban vision as a preference for a series of towers, 15-storey towers, marching down the gently sloping landscape. Um, while um, 
early Andrews studies for the Cameron project included some residual towers, as you can see on the right, oh, sorry, on the left. He always envisaged, envisaged the project as fundamentally a low-rise, horizontally distributed project. And on the right, what you see is a model of the building as built. The prospect of building in Australia meant that Andrews had to seek out local consultants to work with him. I mean, he, he was very collaborative in his approach to architecture, he, he, but he needed to build teams of collaborators both within his own office and ex from external consultants. He, 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 he built teams that he trusted and that he continued to work with long term. Um, and, and thus began a relationship with the Sydney-based services and mechanically engineer Don Thomas, with whom Andrews would work on many of the projects of the rest of his career back in Australia. He also worked with the landscape architect Richard Strong like this. Uh, he'd first met Strong while both were working at the John B. Parkin office, uh, and both Thomas and Strong would give Cameron uh, offices a more considered environmental strategy than the intuition on which Andrews had depended in his design career thus far. The Cameron office's uh, design was resolved as seven wings of open plan office space, each three storeys high, with floors of uh, around 50 by 300 feet. Uh, these, are, these office wings are oriented east-west, and at the east of the building is a so-called mall connecting uh, the seven office wings. It's an elevated open walkway, uh, which is, was intended to connect by bridges to housing further to the east and to a civic and retail centre to the north. In the event, uh, neither the housing nor the retail centre were built. The office wings are separated by courtyards, each with a landscape designed by Strong, to represent a different Australian ecosystem. Uh, the roofs of the complex were also planted, the first of several green, green roofs in Andrew's project. So this is, you know, this is 1968, 1969 when this is being devised. As he had at the Moulton Hotel and in the administration part of the Scarborough project, Andrews, Andrews used a step section um, for the Cameron office wings. The step floors, oh, sorry, the floors, <laughs> the floors stepped outwards to the north. Um, so, uh, so upper floors protected the um, northern. Uh, the northern walls of lower wings. You know, remember the sun in the southern hemisphere comes from the north. Um, um, an ingenious and I have to say, I think perversely complicated um, structural arrangement of gallows beams um, across the courtyards supported the office floors on either side with a forest of columns. The structural arrangement offering more shade still to the offices. Um, and, and, and the whole idea was to keep the office floors completely free of structure. Um, and, and you can see again on the, um, on the left of the screen a beautiful model um, um, and on the um, right um, the building actually under construction. I think the model and the, the building under construction are so close it's remarkable. Um, uh, so, th so this arrangement was partly um, informed by the advice that he got from, um, from, um, from his, structure, from his um, services engineer, Don Thomas. Um, uh, and, and, and one particular thing which is, uh, was, early in, was included early in the Cameron design, um, which I think was Thomas's idea, was um, it included provision for a plant to supply the wider Belconnen area with hot and chilled water, um, an innovation uh, for Australia in which there are few such facilities. I know they're common in, in cities of uh, the northeast of the US, but not, not in Australia at all. 
Um, it should be noted that, that from an environmental perspective, Cameron still used the primary architectural form of the building to shape its environmental performance. Its address of environmental issues was almost completely passive. Um, as I mentioned, from Cameron offices onwards, Don Thomas was a constant collaborator with Andrews. The next project on, on which they worked together represented an important change of direction. Uh, this project was the King George Tower in central Sydney. It's called the King George Tower because it's on the corner of King Street and George Street. There's no monarchism implied. Um, uh, this tower has a triangular plan. Again, I, I asked Andrews many times why this triangle plan reappears, and he would not tell me. Um, I don't, I mean, he, 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 he feigned surprise <laughs> that, I, um, uh, that I discovered this pattern, but anyway. Um, the, the orientation of the facades is arranged to open up a pedestrian plaza at ground level, uh, but also organised so that the principal facade, which you can see on the left of the image, um, faces southeast, an orientation that in the southern hemisphere minimises solar heat gain through glass facades. So overall form is again used to address environmental issues, but at the King George Tower for the first time in Andrew's work, lightweight secondary elements are also introduced to shade the facades and incidentally also to provide gangways for maintenance and cleaning. So you can see uh, the, 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 the appearance of this building is very heavily dependent on these lightweight frames supporting these um, glass shades, or, or polycarbonate shades in this case. Uh, and here is an image um, from the interior um, of what that looked like. Um, so th these, um, these Frameworks supporting these shading elements also provided gangways for maintenance and cleaning. These elements are made of stainless steel tubing at King George Tower supporting polycarbonate shades. Uh, these are reflective but from the interior are transparent or nearly so. Andrews compared them with the leaves of deciduous vines that grew across the verandas of Australian farmhouses. They were very lightweight compared to the heavy precast concrete brise soleil, which were very fashionable in Sydney high rises of the period. One of the key considerations for Andrews at the King George site was to minimise deliveries and crane traffic needed in such a busy location. Again, common sense. He did this also by minimising the use of precast concrete elements on the site. Uh, much of the concrete at King George was poured on site and he, he came up with ingenious ways of recycling um, uh, formwork on site so that there did not have to be multiple deliveries of formwork. These lightweight triangulated stainless steel tubes um, then become a strong feature of Andrew's work, carefully designed with Thomas. They reappear in, uh, the, in the design of the Callum offices of 1973, not built uh, as planned, but realised in part five years later as a college of trade and further education. Um, and, the, and then these lightweight uh, elements, again, stainless steel tubes um, holding glass um, at at uh, Woden and at Intelsat, that they, they reappear on the Intelsat headquarters by Andrews. A project in Washington, won by the architects in 1980 and completed in two stages in 1986 and 1988. Uh, and, and then they reappear, I'll, I'll show you Intelsat later, they reappear then in the um, Octagon offices in Sydney's West, completed in 1990. Uh, and this building is now slated for demolition. As the performance of the polycarbonate sheets used at the King George Tower was not satisfactory, with the material degraded much faster than anticipated, Andrew switched the transparent elements on these shading devices to glass. 
And as they developed, the exact distance of the transparent shades to facade glazing was calibrated, again with Don Thomas's input, to have a further environmental benefit. The gap between the shades and the facade glazing encouraged updrafts in summer conditions, pulling hot air away from the building's windows to further mitigate heat gain. No elements in Andrew's buildings, however, had a singular rationale. Although Andrew's claims of common sense would be used again and again to explain the stainless steel webs that wrapped his buildings of the 1970s and 1980s, I think they also have another possible origin. As a young architect working in the office of John B. Park and Associates in Toronto, Andrews was influenced by two American architects with developing reputations in that period, the late 1950s, Paul Rudolph and Louis Kahn. I don't have time to get into this issue of influence here, and Andrews was, of course, always troubled every time I raised it. Um, uh, but um, I think we, we, we can see this sort of Kahnian influence in, in Andrew's use of circulation devices, basically vertical tubes of concrete um, and then concrete and, um, and glass block, as you can see here at, um, at, at the Octagon offices. And, and, and what happens with these, with these, um, um, these circulation tubes, these servant spaces, is Andrews makes them his own by his sort of delirious repetition of them. I mean, I th you know, they, they become his device, not Khan's. Uh, so here they are uh, again at the Sydney Convention Centre, project finished in 1988 and demolished in 2014. I surmise that the triangulated steel secondary forms that Andrews used as climate modification devices also have a Kahnian beginning. In the City Tower Project for Philadelphia by Kahn with Anne Ting, published in Perspector in 1953, versions of the City Tower, like King George, also have a triangular overall plan. Asking Andrews about this got nowhere, um, he was he was never happy that, 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 the, that I suggested he might have been influenced by other architects, even when he was a young man. Um, perhaps this doesn't really matter very much, but um, I am interested in trying to understand patterns across the work of separate architects, um, and we, we, nowadays we have to do this without calling on the old trope of the zeitgeist, because no one can tell us how the zeitgeist works. So we, we have to look for more um, literal, I guess, um, patterns of influence. Um, so here is uh, this project uh, by Khan which I, and Ting, which I think may have been the source of Andrew's triangulated secondary structures. Uh, this is uh, the design, uh, one of the designs of the City Hall project in Philadelphia, obviously not built. Uh, the design means that Andrews uses to address environmental performance that I've so far discussed only pertain to passive control. Under the influence of Thomas, Andrews' projects from Callum, um, and here's the original design for Callum offices, um, uh, Andrew's projects from Callum offices onwards become increasingly, come increasingly to entail active technologically driven means which do not necessarily have consequences for architectural expression. Um, as I said before, this occurs first in the area heating scheme proposed for the Cameron offices which was not realised. But at Callum, or at least in its part realisation as the Woden College of Trade and Further Education, a, sch a scheme to, to use recovered heat from refriger refrigeration plant, laboratory discharges and general space use usage using large water tanks uh, in the basement of the building was implemented to mitigate energy use for, um, uh, for heating during the winter technological means for managing environmental control and energy use then appear in several Andrews projects, including the Intelsat headquarters building and the Octagon office building. 
Uh, before I examine Intelsat, I want to look at another Andrews design of the 1970s, um, perhaps the most environmentally explicit but also fanciful of Andrews projects, uh, also involving Don Thomas. And this was the design of the central area of the new city of Monato, uh, planned by the state government of South Australia from 1970. Monato was to be built 70 kilometres east of the state's principal city of Adelaide. It was intended to be built by 1980, initially for a population of 100,000 and ultimately 200,000. Uh, and here is a Monato project not by Andrews, but anyway, I'll get to this now, I guess. The idea of Monato was conceived and taken forward during a period of increased environmental awareness in Australia that's occurring substantially, at least in the built environment disciplines, under the influence of Ian McCarg, um, who visited Australia in 1971 and spoke publicly. The Monato project was predicated on the development of an ecologically responsive uh, urbanism featuring large swathes of parkland that would rem remediate the degraded agricultural landscape on which Monato was to be built. Um, and this was mostly to occur through revegetation. And, and the Monato design getting going from 1973 also coincided with the energy crisis of that year. The urban planning for Monato was undertaken by the British firm of Shanklin Cox and the initial city, central city design was by a local architect called Boris Kazansky. Um, in 1974, Kazansky provided the Monato Development Commission with a proposal for the, the Monato Hub, which you see on the right, a building, a building featuring huge tent-like roofs. Uh, Kazansky had previously worked in Germany for Rolf Gutbrod, uh, the German architect who was Fry Otto's mentor and who had been responsible with Otto for the tensile roofs of the West German Pavilion at Montreal's uh, um, Expo 67. Um, the hub was, des was described by Kazansky as a carnivalesque centre for communal activities, a space exposition and for fun. Um, the Monato commissioners hated it. <laughs> and they immediately turned to Andrews for an alternative. Andrews uh, provided them with a design which concentrated not on fun, but rather on the workaday world of the government agencies that the South Australian government intended to relocate to Monato. At the centre of the Andrews scheme was an, uh, a series of office buildings and two and three storey wings around square courtyards disposed to step down a gentle slope. It was akin to the off Cameron Office's design. The courtyards featured not gardens as a, as, as a Cameron, but a series of cascading, cascading pools to provide both physical cooling, the Monato site has very hot summers, and a psychological sense of coolness. The Andrews buildings are linked by a map plan tessellation geometry that can be conceptually, that can conceptually continue indefinitely. And, and, uh, and, that they, and these office buildings were aligned with the main urban axis in the project. Reports on their Monato design by the Andrews office make clear a commitment to a low energy city. Quote, it is also considered that a strong response to the worldwide problem of energy shortage of energy shortage would be appropriate, avoiding wastefulness in the systems of the city by utilising natural solar and wind energy, recycling waste or reconverting it to energy, providing minimum energy consumptive alternatives for personal movement, etc. I mean, they were envisaging something like electric cars, I guess. This is 1975. An unattributed and undated document affixed to an Andrews uh, personal archive to a later Monato design report by his office addresses several related issues. Building orientation, natural ventilation, thermal storage, the embodied energy content of building materials. Again, this is 1975. Solar and wind energy. Um, 
this report also, or this document also refers to a central energy tower, a landmark at one end of the central city axis, axis in the Andrews design. Uh, and here's an image uh, drawn by um, the Sydney architect uh, Philip Cox, who worked along with Andrews on um, Andrews' uh, Monato project. And you can see the, the uh, energy tower, as it's called, um, somewhat mysteriously in the middle of the image. Um, uh, in the last known submission to the Monato Development Commission from Andrews, the tower is described, this tower is described as taking advantage of the year-round energy availability of natural resources such as wind, solar energy and water, but exactly the means by which it would do so uh, are left completely to the reader's imagination. Um, the technologies through which this occur are not specified at all. While Andrews trusted Don Thomas, who, as I said, was consultant on this project, the idea of this energy tower um, 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 uh, entailed a, technologi a technological leap of faith that contributed to Andrews' sense that Monata was unlikely to eventuate. Um, and indeed, he was right. It didn't happen. Nevertheless, the idea of an energy tower um, would reappear in Andrews' own work in a writ small in the house which he built for himself and his family on his farm property in western New South Wales. Um, he worked on this starting in 1978 and was completed in 1980. This is the house at Ugara. Um, this tower uh, appears to me at least to be waiting for some technological invention, some sort of gentle wind turbine perhaps to give justification to its very prominent part in the house's design. So there's a certain sort of rhetoric of energy and, uh, and, a, and, and the sort of reality which, which Andrews is trying to bring together. The gap between environmental rhetoric and reality apparent in Monato is also at stake in Andrews' realised design for the Intelsat headquarters in Washington. And this was the, the architect's last widely published design. And, and here I must mention we, we have in the audience tonight um, Mo Feingold, who, uh, whose firm, um, Nutter Feingold, was um, the partner, um, the local partner, uh, to, to, who helped realise the Intelsat project. Um, I want to pursue this issue by looking at the way the Intelsat design came to win the competition and then how it was received in the architectural press. Um, and in doing this, I'll get into some technical detail, I'm sorry, um, and even some numbers. Um, but I hope you'll be patient with me as I do so. Intelsat was commissioned through a limited international design competition staged in 19. 1980. Um, Andrew's design for the Intelsat competition is directly derived from his plan of the Callum offices of 1973. So you see the ca half the Callum offices design on the left and you see uh, Intelsat stages one and two on the right. They're really remarkably alike. Um, Andrews regularly explored architectural ideas across multiple projects, but in this case the translation from one project to the other is very direct. I think this indicates a certain frustration that Callum was extremely compromised in its realisation at a much diminished scale, and, and yet Andrews thought that Callum had pursued a line of architectural investigation that was too good to discard. It also possibly suggests that Andrews was not willing to invest too much in a preliminary design uh, for a competition where he had only a one in eight chance of winning because there were eight competitors. Uh, so recycling an already developed design idea was a good compromise. The office pods at Intelsat are taller than they are at Callum, you know, four to six floors instead of three. And instead of being separated by outdoor spaces traversed by walkways as they are at Callum, they are separate, separated by glazed atria. This is, of course, is a response to Washington's climate, um, hot and sticky in summer and cold in winter. 
though I have to say it's only marginally less pleasant than Canberra's, which is also hot and cold. The atria uh, were also uh, the atria at uh, until sat were also part of Don Thomas's environmental strategy for the building. Uh, air drawn through the atria was humidified by means of pools featuring in some. The planting in the atria uh, and also the roof gardens, which also feature at Intelsat, uh, was again by Dick Strong. There were nine octagonal plan office pods in the first stage with three atria, uh, four more pods and two atria were added in the second stage. On the exterior of the building, the glazed screens that Andrews and Thomas had first devised at the King George Tower um, were again used. In a report with his competition entry, Andrews described the overall pl form, plan and section arrangements of the Intelsat design as being the outcomes of analysis of the Intelsat organisation's needs, its preferences for cellular rather than open plan offices, you know, the pod arrangement, uh, the pod and atrium arrangement um, uh, maximised the number of perimeter offices which were, were, were possible. Uh, and, 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 and he also explains that, uh, you know, his design is a response to Intelsat's request for efficiency and a combination of passive energy principles and active, and active systems. So again, at um, Intelsat, we have a, um, a, 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 um, a heat recovery system embedded into the project, uh, and here it is being installed. Um, all the measures that would achieve major energy savings, including the atria and the facades, facade screens, are set out by Andrews. The assessment criteria for the Intelsat design competition were threefold. Design considerations, accommodation of Intelsat's use requirements, and implementation and costs. Chaired by Pietro Bluschke, the competition jury produced an extensive assessment of the Andrews design in relation to these criteria. But even in considering the Andrews design against such technical matters as space requirements and environmental performance, the architect jurors for Intelsat consistently fell back to the question of what the design would look like and how it would be experienced. The jury wrote, quote, the overall appearance of the building is largely determined by the energy savings requirements. Even the tri-dimensional screens placed as a protection of the exterior walls become important architectural elements when we think of the richness of effect which can be de derived from the very complex casting of shadows by the elements of the screens themselves and of the lightweight structures which support them." End of quote. The design's focus on energy issues is, quote, not expressed in reduced or punitive terms. You know, it's interesting to think that the architects would think that energy saving might be punitive. Um, but as optimistically suggested as a development of explicit and expressive volumes, which especially at night when lighted, will communicate the image of a positive technology rich in imagination, both vital and essential. I think it's very interesting to think of the, these jurors writing about the energy response of the building positively by imagining it lit up at night. You know, um, Perhaps it is not surprising that three architects serving on the Intelsat design competition jury did not undertake any technical analysis of the design, but a larger assessment panel working along, alongside the architectural jury, including Intelsat's director of engineering, also made no technical analysis, instead deferring to Andrew's own claims about the technical performance of his design. This is especially apparent in relation to energy usage. This broader assessment panel noted that the Andrews design involved much lower lighting costs than were usual in Washington. And here, here are some numbers. <laughs> they commented, in a typical Washington office building with an annual energy consumption of 65,000 British thermal units per square foot, some 30,500 British thermal units are associated with lighting. 
and the Andrews design by providing, by providing much exterior exposure, a photocell automatic turn off system and the use of a space frame to give insulation without blocking unwanted light, a projected energy a projected light energy budget for Intelsat headquarters is estimated to be only 12,830 British thermal units. These figures were transcribed directly from information supplied by the Andrews office. So here's a chart from the Andrews submission to the Intelsat competition, which has ex these exact figures which are cited by the, by the technical uh, assessors as being factual. Um, the figures of 65,000, 30,500 and 12,830 British thermal units all appear in, the, in, in, in this diagram. The report, um, uh, the, uh, um, the report on, the, on, on Andrew's project also included a figure of 24,500 British thermal units per square foot per annum for total annual energy consumption and a calculated energy savings of 61.5% compared to Washington norms. These figures, or near variations, were then widely reported in the architectural press. Writing in, the, in, writing in April 1980 on the selection of the Andrews design, the Washington Post's architecture critic Wolf von Eckhart, who had hated Gund, um, uh, noted very, he was, but he was very positive about it. Until Sat, um, he, he noted, while the average Washington, average Washington office building consumes 65,000 British thermal units per square foot per year, the Intelsat building is estimated to require only 24,000 per square foot per year. After the first stage of the Intelsat headquarters was completed, reports in the architectural media continued to riff off the Andrews statement of a 61.5% comparative energy saving in the Intelsat design. The journal Architectural Records suggested that Intelsat's energy use was, quote, less than 40% less than of the norm for comparable Washington buildings. Buch Peter Buchanan in the Architectural Review noted, quote, energy consumption is less than 40% of the norm for comparable buildings in Washington. Reporting the same figures, the um, writer, writing under an acronym, NRG, at least acknowledged in Architecture, the Journal of the American Institute of Architects, that such figures were estimates only. And I haven't been able to find data on the building's actual energy performance. We, 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 it simply can't be located in any archival source. While the architectural press, like the Intelsat design jury, just reported Andrew's own estimates about the energy use and savings, they were wildly inventive in other aspects of their critiques, playing on Intelsat's off-planet responsibilities. Intelsat was an international organisation for administering and expanding satellite networks. Architectural writers could not help themselves in making sci-fi connections. For von Eckhart, it was architecture for the year 2001. Peter Buchanan made a connection to Star Trek. While under the title Uncommon Sense, um, I have to say the title I discovered had been, has already been used, Margaret Gasky, writing in Architectural Record, uh, wrote that Intelsat evokes the space age imagery of Star Wars. In architecture, the journal, again, NRG, under the headline, High Tech Castle on a Wooded Hill, wrote that Intelsat was a, fu a futuristic tour de force and that its atria were reminiscent both of Russian constructivism and Louis Barragan, uh, with, quote, a little Darth Vader, Darth Vader thrown in. In a word, both for the jury that selected the Intelsat design and the architectural critics who responded to it, the question of the design's environmental performance was subordinated, subordinated to the question of the design's appearance. Science was subordinated to, to science's look. 
and I don't really think things have changed in the last 40 years. I, I, I think, as, as uh, an occasional critic of buildings, I, I don't think I could assess their energy performance credentials even now. All of this is not to say um, All of this is not to say that the Intelsat did not perform as its designer's analyses suggested that it would. I just don't know. So to conclude, Intelsat itself concluded a line of inquiry into environmental design concerns in, in Andrew's work that started with his intuitive responses to the climate of Toronto. This became increasingly sophisticated and technical in his collaboration with Don Thomas, from the Cameron offices onwards. Um, but in the, in the last of the major collaborations with Thomas, the environmental design aspect of Intelsat, of the Intelsat design, still did not matter enough in architectural culture to be scrutinised. Or more likely, those who critiqued the building, for the most part positively, lacked the skills to assess its technical performance. Intelsat's beguiling appearance could then be reclaimed for imaginative, specu imaginative speculation to be construed as a cinematic spaceship. You know, Andrews was ahead of the game that his critics were playing. Um, you know, that's, that's my kind of a concluding point. Thank you very much. Thank you for that um, tour through John Andrews. Um, we will keep this actually a fairly short conversation so that we can continue with a, a informal conversation in the in the gallery with the reception. Um, but I, I am curious first to, to really um, get you to talk about the um, re repetition that you see in all of these projects, uh, whether the sort of the repetition of the unit that's happening either at the large scale that you see in Intelsat or even in w what we see in Gun Hall, and this use of repetition as a formal device, how it's how it's you s you frame it within within uh, Andrew's work. Um. I think uh, I think Andrew starts out as entirely intuitive architect and who moves from project to project, um, inventing form anew. Um, and um, and at some point he starts realizing, from his point of view of common sense, that this is not <laughs> a sensible way to proceed. Um, that there is enough commonality in projects to warrant um, uh, revisiting ideas and refining them. I think this is a great idea. I mean, I think it's a very important idea. Uh, I have to say, I mean, uh, some of the things that are repeated, like the Triangle Towers, I, I don't understand the origin of that. Um, and uh, as I said, John, um, you know, I think somewhat, um, uh, you know, with a wry smile on his face, you know, kind of um, declined to comment. Um, because that one, you know, there is no technical reason, I suppose, for it, that at least I can uh, see. Um, I, I think that he, he, he was always, you know, this common sense idea was always a certain kind of economy. You know, economy of effort uh, to get the design done. Um, to uh, he, he liked to have these consistent teams both within his own office and teams uh, of consultants from outside his own office, because again he 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 thought this was a way of you know kind of economising on the need to communicate afresh um, his vision for things. So um, uh, I think and 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 it's certainly true that you told me. That, that you know, and, and also said he wasn't going to spend any time on on doing a design where he had only one in eight chance of getting it, even though he got it. It, 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 it. And he may as well recycle a design that he he was still intrigued by. 
So I was, I was asking more about the repetition of, of units within each design, but I, I'm curious what your, your answer actually leads me to ask something that I want to bring all three of you into, which is sort of, I mean, you, you sort of beautifully illustrate the point that the, the quote that I had given from Kevin's thesis of how laconic he is, right, and how you had to extract things from this figure who didn't write about his projects, didn't really talk much about his work. Uh, and so we have to resort to reading the, the work as it is and also the representation of the work. Um, and I think that there's a kind of economy of means in his presentation, in his manner of, of how he didn't speak much, how he, he counted on the work, but also an economy of means in the repetition of the unit within the work um, and the, the use of representation to present his argument, which, um, so I was, I was curious if, if any one of you, and, and I know this speaks partly to your thesis, Kevin, which I know a little too well maybe, but um, uh, I wonder if you want to speak to this idea of how he was communicating, how you can read ideas in his, in his work. I think that's a, a little tough one, I think, that, um, uh, sort of my interest, I think, um, looking, I think, at the expansive um, uh, work of uh, Paul Walker on, on John Andrews, um, was tr uh, trying to, I think, unpack um, some of the sort of more relevant um, parts of practice um, uh, uh, to my own interests. Um, and there's something strange about some of the plans where you can almost imagine, I think, each of these modules as little stamps and sort of reproducing each of them um, across a plan is actually a really, really simple way of just filling out the page kind of thing. And I think looking at the Callum offices, um, how each of them could actually just be like a little stamp that you could sort of duplicate. Um, and I think uh, it sort of plays, it out, uh, plays itself out in a strange way um, where I think, uh, on the um, opportunity that I had to tag along with uh, Nori on the visit to Intelsat, how I impossibly confusing those spaces are when you end up, I think, uh, sort of in one of the bays uh, going across one of those spaces. I don't think that answered the question. <laughs> Nori, you, um, in, the, in the little exhibition booklet, talk about um, the, the importance of revisiting the, the projects and, and sort of understanding what it's like to, to photograph a project after it's lost its sheen and gleam of these spaceship projects. But I, I wonder, given, again, this, this um, laconic sense of, of, of how we get to the Andrews projects, what you were trying to present in these photographs that um, you feel wasn't present in the in the drawings of mm. of Andrews? Yeah, I think I think a lot about um, both the drawings as well as the archival images that are first made when a building is completed. So, in terms of the way my personal interest in terms of photography of uh, built environments, a lot of it is informed through my experience of working at the Nuggetine Capsule Tower. And I worked at that particular site for 12 years up until its demolition this past summer. And from that experience of the building, I've, I've always been interested, or I, I've been consistently interested the last few years of this kind of relationship between how a building is captured at the moment as creation or completion, and how that image becomes such a dominant representation of that structure in terms of, like, say, people's memory or the media. Uh, and, and you know, that, that practice of documenting a building upon its completion is very uh, established. It's common. And yet, um, how extensively is a building documented or captured after, it's, after the years has passed? And I, I think for, particularly for John Andrews' building, that was like a, like a major theme in the sense that what happened to these buildings after they were completed? Like, I, I know how they appear in terms of archival images. But I think especially in terms of understanding John Andrews, what happened to his buildings is really important in terms of not only the building, but the 
aspect of his career, what happened afterwards. So I thought, for me, that was really crucial in terms of capturing and navigating what, what, what remains of his career. I'm, I'm going to ask one last question before we open to the audience, and it's, it's back to you, Paul, of, of sort of, um, I guess the, the thesis behind your argument of the, the, these are buildings that sort of where the science is more on display than, than sort of the, the technical result is, is actually um, argued. Um, the, the, the subordination of the science to the look, let's say. Um, what, you, you teach both history theory and you teach design. What is your underlying message to the, the designers of today in, in making this argument? Well, you know, there, there is a certain you know, dilemma that um, I, don't, I don't think sustainability gives us a kind of, a, a kind of On. Yeah, um, I, I don't think sustainability. Ne ne well, it's, it's, it's like many of the things that architects work with now. You know, technical systems, um, a kind of ethical responsibilities which bear on the built environment very urgently. Um, they don't necessarily lend themselves to being expressed, and that's and yet and yet what we um, are, are trying to persuade students to do, I suppose, is to find some connection between expressive potentiality and um, th their responsibilities as environmental designers and you know and with the wider sets of ethics which uh, now bear on us urgently so uh, I mean I think you have to I think you I mean I do think you have to give students some sort of sense of optimism not pile problems on their backs um, you have to you, you have to say well uh, at least, at least one of the things we can do, I think, in doing history is to show that architects have struggled with these dilemmas or dilemmas like these in the past, and have, have you know, they, they may not have come up with the perfect answer, but they've come up with answers which are, are, are you know, which which grab people's imaginations. So I, I, I would say that Andrews was very serious about environmental issues. He worked with this guy Don Thomas because he realised this guy actually knows his P's and Q's, he knows what's going on. Um, uh, I don't think that Andrews himself necessarily understood a lot of what um, uh, Thomas uh, necessarily proposed and certainly didn't find a way of, um, you, you, you know, of finding the, 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 the uh, finding ways of architecturally expressing the presence of um, computerised systems of window control, for instance, you know, for ventilation. So they're, 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 they're you know, and, and so look, I, I, I think we can, I think as a historian, we can point to examples like Andrews of architects who have taken these things seriously and and produced really remarkable buildings as a result. They may not be perfect. Um, but that, that, but that's a, but that's I think is our responsibility as educators to not burden students with, um, with uh, a kind of responsibility that no architect has ever discharged. You know. I will say if the um, windows here were double pane, this building would perform much better. Um, but well, that well, really wasn't Andrew's fault. Um, Andrew's, Andrew's did, um, uh, did have uh, more extensive environmental ambitions for this building than were realized. Sadly, that's where the value engineering came in and where our students pay the price. Um, uh, excellent. So we we open the floor. So, uh, oops, sorry. Um, we'll we'll start with Mo. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to make a comment about the scale. The, the, I, w I wanted to make a comment, if I may, about the scale issue. I think from the earliest times I remember John's work in in studio, he was working on an organic system of connecting elements together. I think he, he did not like large buildings. I think if you th think of what Intelsat might have been if it were just a, another Washington clunk, it, uh, it's absolutely extraordinary. And I'm sorry that the images don't portray it. Well, it's repetitive. As, and yes, he took that idea that he started at Woden. He built it, it was built it in, uh, on Connecticut Avenue. 
And he actually tried the same concept again in, when he was invited to uh, have a competition for the expansion of the World Bank you know, a few blocks away. And John Nouvel was then the chairman of the jury and gave John a really hard time at the jury as to why he would use the same idea again. But it was about the scale and how people work together uh, in smaller units. And I think that is prevalent throughout. And that, of course, came from CERT. His first uh, CERT's mantra was, the work designed for the human scale, create a variety of visual experiences, uh, and by the way, integrate the work of artists. But that's, but th that was that's my comment about uh, what I s remember was achieved with with this kind of repetition, uh, and uh, uh, and I wish there were more of it being tried, S such as. Excuse me, without deliberating, such as I remember a, a scheme in Boston that Paul Rudolph had designed for where the Moakley Courthouse now is. And it was a very organic uh, thing that's like a sloped uh, a town, a townscape. But uh, uh, so be it. Uh, we no, I think I, I think that that's absolutely um, spot on. This idea of, of breaking it down like that—the combination of breaking it down into something that's more human, but also repeating it in a way that's that's actually not so human—is is quite interesting to sort of see that tension. Um, Jacob, you had a question as well. Yeah, I. Um in the context of a professional school, I think it's important also to talk about the individuals and how they got to where they got. Um, and I think something that stands out in Andrew's, you know, not just is there kind of a lack or a, a kind of a reticence around talking about the work, but also at least in this presentations like this, it really, the career itself is really hard to understand how he got from point A to point B. And, you know, just, you can see within, judging by this, like within less than 10 years from graduating from GSD, he was designing the new building for GSD as well as, you know, which you could maybe chalk that up to a relationship with the Dean, but then also the other projects you're showing, which some of them are quite significant, so they took a long period of time to complete, but he was being selected for these projects really within 10 years out of school, which um, for students in school, that may seem like a long time, but it really isn't. Like that's like your most junior faculty being selected to design this building um, at that stage in their career. I'm just curious, you know, usually when you scratch below the surface, there's a story there, right? And whether that's personal connections or you know marriage or, or just genius or some superpower. So based on what you know about John Andrews, um, how, how did he achieve that? And is there anything, any lessons that you could tell students who are graduating now that they could draw from that experience? Look, look there's no doubt that Andrews was charismatic. He, he was a um, larger than life person as everyone who knows, knew him would, would tell you. He was very charismatic, he was, but at the same time, I mean, there was luck. I mean, uh, I don't know why Tom Howarth, you know, who was the, you know, chair of architecture at the University of Toronto, decided three young um, um, uh, staff members, uh, faculty, um, should be given the project of um, coming up with a provisional master plan for a campus for 10,000, five or 10,000 students. I mean, it's just not imaginable in my context. I mean, you know, where the university has, you know, preferred suppliers who are the most boring architects in Melbourne, um, you know, with with small projects given to up and comers, you know, but uh, you know, it, you know, the, I, I think I think the '60s in Canada, particularly, uh, was, you know, they didn't have a risk, <laughs> the risk averse culture that we. Well, than in Australia has now, and I think probably is true everywhere. You know, so it, it, the, you know, John's career was made through Scarborough. The, the, there is no doubt that everyone uh, working in education in North America was very aware of Scarborough College's success, uh, and um, uh, and Claude Bissell, who was um, the president of the university and who admired Andrews very deeply. Um, uh, I, I think one of the clues to Gund Hall is that Claude Bissell was the first pro visiting professor of Canadian studies at, um, at uh, Harvard in 1966-67. So I've no doubt um, that somehow his experiences of John's success with Cameron 
um, made their way not just through um, you know, the kind of architectural networks, but through university administration networks to, um, to the administration of um, Harvard. But we, we, we simply don't know this, but I think it's really remarkable that that, that you know, that, that, so it, it's coincidence, it's luck, but it's also charisma and being able to grasp the luck when it presents itself to you. I, I think he gave Cert to get the job here, I think he gave Cert a lot of really good chocolate, which yeah, I, I recommend as a technique. You give the dean a lot of really good chocolate, you might get a commission. Um. Hi, my name is um, Christopher Riker Vasilides. I'm the son of Otto Riker Vasilides, M. Arc 58, and a classmate of John Andrews. Um, two comments and, and a question for you. Um, the, you know, the tower in his house in Ugaura, you, you talked about kind of technology and engineering. That was actually an air conditioning tower. So he showed it to me once. He turned it on. We visited the house. He turned it on. And within minutes, the heat, the dry heat of January in Australia became really cool with the evaporative air. It was really quite amazing. Um, and I hadn't really noticed the pyramid theme. So this is kind of a question for you, really. Um, the pyramid themes in his buildings. But he did say that he was on the selection committee for the Australian Parliament House, which is a pyramid embedded into nature and whatnot. And uh, he'd had stories about collaboration across politics. But did, he, did, did you ever ask him about that building and, and, and in the context of your questions about pyramids? And actually, just one last comment. Scarborough, he said when we had dinner that the reason he got that commission was because he happened to be on campus in summer and the thing came across his desk, and he grabbed the opportunity. So that was what Woody Allen said, 99% of success is being in the right place or turning up, so. Yeah. Um, I think Ugara um, was designed, with, Ugara was designed while he was judging the parliament competition. I, I haven't included this in the book because people have told me this is poppycock, but. <laughs> There is a remarkable similarity of the plan of Uga the Ugara House and the Parliament. You know, they both, you know, so the, 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 the semicircles that, that form the back walls of the Senate and the House of Representatives, I think they emerge as these sort of little curved walls around the fireplace. Um, and, you know, but people tell me I'm crazy when I, when I say this stuff, you know, that it's a little formalism and... But I think, I, and, and the central tower at Ugara, I think, I, I think it's, of course, that there are environmental rationales for it. But why it's so central? Why, why, it, why you place it right in the middle of the house so that the fireplace that's underneath it sort of blocks the connection of the living room and the dining space, which you would ideally want to be connected. I mean, I think it does it brilliantly. But it, it's sort of like, it's. A, 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 it's a pro pro problem perversely set up by the architect and then brilliantly solved. Um, I mean, Andrews, Andrews really admired uh, uh, Jurgler. I mean, he 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 got to, he he was he. He was not a postmodernist, and 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 yet he did, had no qualms about selecting a design for the for the Australian Parliament, which could be read as postmodern. And it's certainly a lot of its detailing, um, you know, the Parliament is postmodern, all the, you know, marble revetments and all that stuff. But but he just saw it as a brilliant planning idea, uh, and um, he got to know Jurgler. Um, I mean, Jurgler visited the house at Ugara when it was completed. Uh, and um, selected some stone for Parliament to be used at Parliament from the Ugara, uh, which, which he'd seen, first seen at Ugara. So it came from a local quarry. Um, so, um, so Andrews was kind of indifferent to stylistic arguments. So he, 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 when he did speak, he did say that postmodernism was poppycock and we, we should all disregard it. But he, he himself was. Um, willing to look at postmodern projects on their own terms. Um, I mean, I think the most remarkable thing about Andrew's career is, this, is the selection while he was chair of the jury uh, for the Hong Kong peak competition of Zaha Hadid. You know, you just think that's kind of completely at odds with everything he stands for. 
I, I've no doubt that um, Isazaki, who was on that jury, probably drove that decision. But nevertheless, Andrews gave it as imprimatur. And, and he, I asked him about that, and he told me, well, you could just see she had something. You know, like, you know, and, and, um, and it might not have been something that he himself was very comfortable with, but he knew that this was going to change things. So he, he, was willing to give, he was willing to give people opportunities also because he had had the experience of getting opportunities when he was a young, when he was a young man. I'm, I'm mindful of, of time and so want to move to the reception, but I want to thank you for um, giving this story of someone who's, who's hard to capture and yet who, I mean, who's, who's laconic in, in voice, but who left these massive things, <laughs> these, these few projects, but massive projects uh, that were, I think, incredibly significant, certainly for us, this building. And so um, I want to thank you and invite everyone to please continue out in the Drucker Design Gallery. Thank you.